Hello, this is Todd Tracy with the Tracy Law Firm in Dallas, Texas with another Todd Talk. Today I want to talk with you about the importance of airbags and many people think that airbags are a relatively new safety feature, but they really aren't. In fact, today I have with me uh, one of my primary experts on restraint system safety and this gentleman's name is Steve Sison and he uh, is really one of the fathers and creators of the air cushion restraint system that ultimately became known as the airbag system in General Motors. We have uh, airbags these days in vehicles that aren't just frontal airbags. We have airbags for the torso, we have airbags for the head, we have combination head, torso, and pelvis, we have side curtain airbags. Uh, what are some of the big issues that, we, that you see as a consultant looking at these vehicle defect cases around the country? I think one of the big things I see is that side airbags uh, often don't deploy when you need them in crashes. And, so, and if they do deploy, sometimes they deploy too late. Um, and then there are a lot of vehicles where the crash sensors are not placed appropriately to fire the side airbags in the types of crashes that you see uh, most frequently. They're only really designed to fire the side airbags in the government crash test and in the crash test that's conducted by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. So they, they generally have a crash sensor uh, back here in the pillar. They don't have a crash sensor here in the area of the base of the windshield. Uh, a very large percentage of real world crashes occur where vehicles or trees or poles hit this area at the base of the windshield and the side airbags don't go off in those crashes. Now, a lot of times we see people today that are going out and they buy these vehicles that have these side curtains on them and they expect those side curtains to fire in a rollover. Do a lot of these vehicles that these people have bought, uh, are they going to fire in a rollover? Not unless the vehicle has a rollover sensor and their rollover sensors are being phased in. They started coming in in relatively small numbers in about 2003, and now they're uh, getting to be more universal. Most sport utility vehicles and pickup trucks now have rollover sensors, but there's an awful lot of passenger cars that don't have rollover sensors, and the side airbags that they have don't provide protection in rollovers because they don't stay inflated long enough. Well, when you're talking about long enough and, and staying inflated long enough, Give our audience here a, an idea of how long a side airbag will stay deployed in a side impact versus a side curtain airbag will stay inflated in a rollover. Well, typical side airbags only stay inflated for 50 to 150 thousandths of a second. So less than typically a blink of an eye. Blink of an eye is about 250 thousandths of a second. So the airbag is open for significantly less than the blink of an eye. A, a rollover crash typically lasts five to six seconds. So the safety canopy type airbags, the airbags that are designed to provide protection in rollovers, those airbags stay inflated for about six seconds. And they do that by coating the fabric so that the fabric is no longer porous and so it, the air doesn't bleed through the airbag fabric and it stays inside. They also use what's called a cold gas inflator. Um, one of the, the typical side airbag, like the side airbag in the driver's seat of this vehicle, uses a gas generator that generates relatively hot gas. And that hot gas, as it cools, loses pressure. And so most of the inflators for safety canopy type airbags generate gas at much lower temperatures. And so uh, it doesn't lose pressure as it cools down either. Why are we interested in keeping the, uh, the side curtain or the side canopy airbag up so much longer in a rollover than we are in a side impact? Well, a, a rollover accident, the vehicle stops over, let's say a hundred feet. And if you're traveling at 30 to 35 miles an hour at the start of a rollover event, you uh, have to cover that 
entire 100 feet. Or if you start out at 30 miles an hour, that's 44 feet per second, or let's say for round numbers, you start out at 50 feet per second, your average speed over that 100 feet is only 25 feet per second, so your time required to travel 100 feet is four seconds. So that airbag has to inflate before the vehicle starts to roll over and stay inflated until the vehicle comes to rest. So it has to stay inflated for at least four seconds, even for a relatively low speed rollover that starts at uh, a little over 30 miles an hour. Now let's take, now let's move away from rollovers for a moment and talk about a frontal impact. How quickly does a vehicle that's traveling 30 or 35 miles an hour, how quickly does that come to a stop of zero? Well, typically about 100 milliseconds or 100 one thousandths of a second. So about a third of the time it takes to blink your eye. And how quickly in, in terms of distance, if you're going 30 to 35 miles an hour, how much uh, space do you have that you are going in that speed down to zero? Well, most vehicles these days, not much more than two feet, if that. So you're going in a frontal impact, you go from 30 to zero in 24 inches in the blink of an eye, and in a 30 mile an hour rollover, you go from 30 to zero in 100 plus feet, plus 4,000 milliseconds, which is four seconds. Correct. And that's why you want to have the uh, the side curtain or the side canopy airbag stay up or what they call have long duration inflation. Yes. Now let's talk about this idea about the narrow frontal offset impact where the impacts are to the left of the headlight or to the right of the headlight. Um, what happens when a vehicle is involved in that narrow frontal offset? What's happening to most of the vehicles uh, to the airbag systems? Well, the airbag systems generally are deploying very late, if at all. Why? Because the crash sensors typically are mounted either to the radiator support or to the outboard side of the main structural rail of the chassis or uh, occasionally to the radiator support. And the radiator support, the chassis, they all end before you get to any um, structural, like there's really no structure out beyond the bumper. There's really no structure out in the area of the headlight. So if you look at this, I've got this Mustang here, there's really no structure in the area of the crash sensors, which are generally down low on the vehicle. And so what you wind up uh, doing is, especially if you, if you run into another car, this uh, unibody rail here, catwalk, doesn't take much load. And uh, so all of the load winds up going into the wheel and tire assembly. And it takes a long time if it gets to the crash sensor to make it from the wheel and tire assembly through the suspension, through the main structure of the vehicle back to the front of the car to get to the crash sensor. All right, so the airbag fires late. What's, what's wrong with that? Well, uh, the rule of thumb that's been used since I was working on airbags is you want the airbag to deploy 30 thousandths of a second before the occupant has moved five inches. And so, so what happens if the airbag deploys promptly is it's pretty much full before the occupant gets to the bag. And if they, and if the airbag fires late, are there some uh, injurious uh, consequences to the occupant? There are. I mean, I've had several cases where the occupant has gotten ahead of the airbag, and then when the airbag deploys, it blows them up into the A-pillar and they get serious head injuries. I've had cases where the occupant gets too close to the airbag before it deploys and it deploys right into their eyes and causes eye injuries, facial fractures, other injuries that are uh, often disabling. I mean, if, if the airbag blinds you, obviously some people recover from that, but if you have a ruptured globe or other really serious eye injury, that can permanently blind you. Well, Steve, 
if, if you have your seat belt on, isn't the seat belt going to hold you in place like a piece of rigid rebar so that who cares if the airbag fires late or not? Unfortunately, belts today are designed to work only if the airbag deploys. The seat belts today have what are called load limiters in the system and they limit the load on the belt to about 700 pounds, give or take. Um, if you think about it, if you weigh 170 pounds and the seat belt can only apply 700 pounds, that means it can only decelerate you with about four Gs. And, and in a 30 mile an hour accident, what kind of Gs are you gonna see on that seat belt in a moment in time? Well, if you, uh, if the occupant, if you're looking at the occupant and the seat and the passenger compartment, those parts of the vehicle are going to see 20 Gs at least. And if the seat belt is only capable of applying four Gs to slow you down, then you're going to move uh, feet within the occupant compartment. And it's particularly dangerous then if the airbag deploys late because you are right up on top of the airbag when it deploys. And that's, that was one of the big problems and one of the big things we were trying to resolve back in the 1970s when people were not belted is we had to get the airbag up and inflated before the occupants got to the belt. Well, now we have the same exact same problem today. The airbag has to deploy promptly because the seat belts don't hold you in your seat anymore. Now, I guess I'm confused because I remember about 15 years ago that the car industry, that the vehicle industry, they started using devices known as pretensioners that actually took the slack out of the belt and helped reposition the occupants in their seat to sort of minimize or prevent forward excursion. What's the change? Well, you know, the problem is that the pretensioner is fired by the same sensor that fires the airbag. And so if the airbag is late, the pretensioner is late. So you're uh, in exactly the same situation as you would have been if you hadn't been belted in the first place. You've got a seat belt that doesn't hold you in your seat. And uh, when the airbag fires and when the pretensioner fires, you're already out of position. You know, I remember looking at when my kids were younger, when they were in child seats, and it always said, make certain that your child's seats, uh, seat belts were, that you could put no less than two fingers between their chest and the shoulder belts because you wanted that child to be firmly uh, secured and restrained inside the child seat. I'm curious, why haven't the car manufacturers taken that philosophy that we do with their children and, and, chil and child seats and done the same thing uh, with our front passenger seats? Well, some manufacturers do. Um, and in some Fords, for example, the pretensioners fire before the airbags. Uh, BMWs, uh, some Mercedes, the pretensioners fire at a much lower threshold. So that gives you a much better chance of the safety belt holding you in your seat before the airbag fires. But it seems to me that there's sort of a, uh, there's sort of a, a, a diametrically opposite philosophy because the pretensioner on the one hand is taking you back in your seat, yet the load limiter is overpowering the pretensioner and allowing you to go forward several inches. I mean, I know that you and I have handled cases where there was 18 inches of load limiter excursion on a vehicle seat belt. Yeah, I mean, I've seen anywhere from eight to 18. And obviously, if your shoulder moves, eight inches, your head moves 10 or 12 inches. If your shoulder moves 18 inches, you're eating the dashboard. So you're eating the dashboard before the airbag even goes off. So there's still a lot of issues with uh, airbags that we see even in 2016. And um, uh, are we gonna continue to see problems with airbags? I would expect so because we've got so many more of them. I mean, we've got airbags in the seats, we've got airbags, uh, Mercedes has airbags in the back windows. Um, I think we're gonna see more and more problems because the more complicated you make things, the more likely you are to have failures. I mean, the, the first rule of 
making something that's reliable is making it simple. But is the Achilles heel on these uh, airbag systems really the cheapest part of it, and that's the sensor? Well, that's definitely a problem because obviously, and, and the decision-making process with regard to when you want the airbags to fire, most manufacturers don't assess whether or not the airbag is going to fire in a real crash. They only assess whether the airbag is going to fire when you run the vehicle into a big block of concrete. Which brings me to another topic I want to chat with you about, and that's this idea that v the vehicle industry since the beginning of time has um, been testing their vehicles to only meet standards rather than trying to protect people in real world accidents. I want you to t talk to us about that. Well, I think that varies from manufacturer to manufacturer, I mean, but I think most manufacturers, because of the limitations of the number of tests you can run, run those tests that either provide them with a, a PR benefit, which would be those tests that uh, allow them to assure themselves that they're going to do well in the government new car assessment program tests, because if you do well in those, you get a good star rating and oh, you, you get, get good five, publicity. You get a five star rating. You get a five star, you get a five star, you get to sell lots more cars. If you do well in the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety tests, they give you a thumbs up, a green uh, rating, like they have a, a, this a uh, color scale. crash test, they have side impact crash test that they run. If you do well in those tests, then you get good publicity. So it's, I think it's more publicity driven um, and obviously financial. You, you can only run so many crash tests, so they run the crash tests, they're gonna get them the best PR. Well, aren't some of the manufacturers even getting away from doing uh, crash testing these days and only doing computer simulations? I recall a commercial uh, for a Ford of Europe where they said we did 12,000 simulations. Yeah, and I think, I don't know if it, they're getting away completely from crash testing, <coughs> but they are relying on computer modeling and you know, obviously trying to keep up with the times. I have computer modeling people do computer models of real world crashes to see why the safety systems didn't work and what could have been done to improve the safety system. Is it important when you're doing a computer simulation like that to also, when Ronald Reagan was president, he always used to say, you need to trust but verify. Um, is it important sometime for uh, lawyers like myself and consultants like yourself to actually go out and verify the accuracy of these computer simulations? Yeah, and, it, and that's, you know, I, I worked on computer simulation when I worked for General Motors, and the key to using computer simulations in any kind of work based on you know, what I learned at GM is validation. You validate the computer model against a known vehicle, and then you make changes to the computer model, and those changes are generally predictive of what happens in uh, whatever type of test you're trying to simulate with the computer. But if you don't validate the model, then the chances of the model being predictive are much smaller. And so that, it's, that's probably the single most important thing to, to do is to look at a crash test or a real world accident and make sure that the model predicts what actually happened within a, a reasonable degree of uh, accuracy. And is that why it's important whenever you do hire a law firm that that law firm has the technological capability and the financial wherewithal to actually go out and run validation testing uh, periodically? Yeah, I and mean, obviously it's important also to have folks that you hire um, who understand the basic operating principles of crash safety. I mean, just hiring any lawyer off the street, that lawyer is not going to know enough about the way that vehicles work to be able to provide you with proper representation. Thank you, Steve, for your time today.
You're welcome.